Hello there and welcome to Brussels, my love, Euronews' weekly chat show that looks at all the news brewing here in Brussels. I'm Maeve McMahon. Thanks for tuning in. Coming up this week, happy belated New Year. 2024 has arrived and with it the same challenges of 2023. But what makes this year different? Bumper elections all across the globe. From India to Russia, South Africa to the US, Two billion voters will be heading to the polls, including here in Europe, when 400 million of us will have our say on the new faces making up the European Parliament. And after marathon talks, EU negotiators clinched a deal on artificial intelligence recently. Known as the AI Act, it would become the first ever rule book in the world and would come into force in two years. We take a closer look at what it could mean for us and for companies developing AI and check if it really can become the playbook for the 21st century. A warm welcome to our panel this weekend. Diederik de Schetzen, Secretary General of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Laura Shields, Managing Director of Red Thread EU. And Andrea Render, Director of Research at the Think Tank here in Brussels, SEPS, and also a university professor over in Florence at the EUI, the European University Institute. So here we are in 2024, still discussing all the various issues that are on the table. Are you happy to see this year start? I have a countdown clock for where the elections are coming. And so uh, uh, we're about at 150 days. We've passed 150 mark. And I think that, is, that shows how, how soon it is and, and that our time to convince is now. It's going to be a busy year, Laura. It's going to be a very busy year. And I think that it's really important that whoever is campaigning or whoever is actually going out to talk to the electorate firstly needs to get them to vote because everybody is tired, fed up and finding life expensive and that they need to offer them something that they can actually be hopeful for rather than just voting for logjam, which is how people are feeling right now. Andrea, people are tired, fed up, also anxious with the constant news cycle. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting year. Um, it could go either way. Uh, we have been surprises mostly on the negative side over the past years. Maybe we get good surprises this year. Elections are always turning points. And so I would not say Europe is at the crossroads because we say it every year. Mm -hmm. Europe is always at, at the crossroads. And it's also we're constant, for the last eight years, we've been told that at every election, democracy is on the line. And I think that's a really hard sell for people now, um, even though since, in, since the last five years, since we had the last European elections, of course, we've had COVID, we've had the war in Ukraine, we've had Gaza, we've got inflation, cost of living crisis. I mean, things are very, very tough for people right now. But I think the democracy is on the line argument. It's going to be very difficult for people to stomach. Well, look, as we said, there'll be elections all across the globe, US, India, the UK, even uh, Russia as well and Ukraine in March. But here in Europe, all eyes, of course, will be on those 6th to 9th June European Parliament elections. And we spoke to Jamie Duke, that is the spokesperson for the European Parliament. And he's sounding pretty confident that people in Europe will be willing to vote. In 2019, there was a significant increase in turnout. Now the polls are telling us that the number of people who have already announced that they are interested in voting is also more or less 10 points higher than five years ago. So indeed I think we have an obligation to be optimistic, because the data is good. The world has become a much more complicated place than before. The new generations have even more problems than previous generations had. But in the end, that gives even more value to the European project. Jai May Duke there speaking. Now, 2019 voter turnout was just over 50%. 2014 it was 42.61%. Diedrich, really, will it go up this year? It's, it's really a half a full and half empty glass. The reality is it was going down and it stopped going down. And, and, and now there are several reasons for that. It could be these initiatives that we have to try to also show the people behind European campaigns, uh, the, the element, uh, use the German word of Spitzenkandidat, that might be it. But I think also people start to realize the importance of, of how EU affects you and elements as we are going to discuss the AI, but also uh, uh, the elements of, of, of candidate states for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. it, it makes it a bit more operational. And, but, but I raised the stakes, though, because I always wanted to make sure that there's a higher turnout, but now I actually want a higher turnout, but also not just based on fear or on element, mm. but also because they actually care. So what's your plan then? What's your strategy? I think our real strategy, what we, we, we pulled, we really checked out 
our, our voters not only through the traditional surveys, but we organize town halls. You could argue it's a lot, it's a little. Look, we, we covered in the last year eight or nine town halls all over, all over Europe. Mm. And, and what matters there is indeed people want to feel listened even more than to provide answers. And that's a good deal because it's quite difficult to offer answers to, mm. to everything. But at least it's a recognition because we, even we feel it, uh, uh, the, the risk of and, and the difficulties of the energy bills going up, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. And especially in rural Europe, people are yes. feeling a little bit left behind, a little bit disenchanted, especially with the green agenda as well coming, coming thick. Um, I just want to touch on the, the voter turnout here in Belgium. Andrea Renda was really, really high because it's obligatory here to vote. But meanwhile, yeah. over in Croatia, it was down at 29.8. That's very few people that went to vote. Yeah, one thing is voter turnout and will be very different across countries. The other thing is the motivation to vote, hmm. as you were saying, right? Uh, some people will go to vote but to, to express support for their national political parties without having a clue about what's yeah. the agenda for Europe. And I think at the moment, uh, given the level of communication from the EU to the local level, uh, I think it's still easier for um, an, a citizen of the European Union to go to the ballot to vote against the idea of Europe than to vote for something that is in the program of one of the political parties or coalitions mm -hmm. that is pro, is uh, in support of a stronger Europe. And uh, this, I think, is a problem. And I think it's a yet another missed opportunity. I hope that in six years we will not go back to the vote with the same uh, sort of uh, informational asymmetry, if you will. Mm. And Laura, of course, trust has eroded as well between Brussels, the EU institutions and citizens, given that Qatar gate, that alleged corruption scandal back in December 2022. Well, I wonder how much that actually plays in member states. I mean, I'm always amazed. I was talking to a friend of mine who used to be a, a sort of bureau chief for one of the major newspapers here, and he's, he covered Brussels for 10 years in the side and out. And the minute he went back to London, it was like Brussels didn't exist anymore. Yeah. I think we here get very obsessed by it. I think it might penetrate a little bit. I don't know how much trust is an issue in there. I would actually agree with Andrea here, which is I think a lot of the time people vote for national issues or they vote against Europe, which is what a lot of these populists offer, because the impact of what happens in Brussels is not felt here. It's felt elsewhere and people don't really understand it. So it's very easy for people to say the EU is a terrible thing and project onto it whatever they want. So I think we should expect a lot more of that. But I think that a pro-European party should be offering something that's much more positive, but that's also really concrete. And I think that's where the EU has historically struggled to communicate. It's always the view from 30,000 feet rather than how are you going to help me invest in, I don't know, a heat pump or solar mm. panels or insulating my house. I think concrete, that is the word, right? Yeah. I mean, But, but the, there's one reality that's also going to happen is that regardless of, of which level of elections, you will have a higher turnout when it's local, when it's very easy to say you want to treat left, right. So we have to set ambitions a bit straight. If you compare the voting turnout at EU level at, for European elections at the one at local one, I don't think it's a full fair game. So the because the operational element is much more complex, it, it is a complex element. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you uh, uh, have a party trick where I can try to explain the Belgian system in 30 seconds, but there's no way I can explain co-decision in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you need uh, to, then? No, <laughs> well, no. if you can explain the Belgian system in 30 <laughs> seconds, that's already <laughs> worth your Nobel Prize. Challenge accepted. Now, yeah. can I say one thing on, the, on what, what you were saying? I mean, the, 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 the Qatar gate is uh, essentially mm -hmm. or largely involving countries like Italy or Greece and so on. So uh, being Italian myself and, and reading the, the, the national press, uh, I can say this has completely disappeared. Uh, the attention span of the of the voters is so mm. short that mm. this has left no trace. Maybe if something happens, uh, you know, uh, in terms of a uh, court decision or, or a new development, you will find in the page 15 mm. of some of the, of the major newspapers. Or something like deep fakes. What if, I mean, deep fake could play a major role in this campaign. Is that something that you're prepared for? Well, we, we not only were prepared, but we really experienced it. So we had our Slovak elections uh, last year in September 2023, where there was at one point one of our leaders and there was a deep fake audio segment mm. where he said it would increase, okay. and as a Belgian, increase the price of beer. Uh, so uh, obviously that, that made a whole uproar, but they managed to find a specialist in the US that managed to show that this was a fake audio fragment and they managed mm. to fight it. So not only are we ready for it, but we actually experienced it. And I think liberals often in the center will be targeted for this. And this is why the elements we'll discuss after of, of uh, AI regulation is also important for that. Well, let's um, now take a look at what the European Parliament could look like after the elections this year. Now, obviously, we're speculating, but we do have a hint from the Brussels-based poll aggregator Europe Elects. They've already published their first projections. You can take a look there. The Conservatives are predicted to stay up on top, followed by the Socialists, 
then Renew Europe. Um, Diedrich, you're of course the Alde party is affiliated with Renew Europe. And the fourth could be Identity and Democracy, uh, the far right group who tend not to participate that much um, in the daily business of the European Parliament and often vote against a number of, of, um, of issues. If you can see now, they have 76 members of the European Parliament, ID, and are set to have between 81 and 91. And what's really telling from that graph is the Greens, right down at the bottom there, the pile, and the left. Laura? Well, I think that... Disappeared? I don't think they've just disappeared. I think the challenge on it is, is that the Europeans and the Greens and the left don't have the momentum at the moment. All the momentum, it seems to be with the far right, but also even the EPP is dancing with the far right, even though they say they're not. I mean, we really don't know. At one level, you've got the EPP will come out and say, oh, no, we never do deals with the, um, the far right because we believe in the cordon sanitaire. But then you get these noises and sort of, frankly, misinformation campaigns around things like the nature restoration law, mm -hmm. where they're saying, you know, they're, off, they're trying to offer a simple solution by saying we're just going to hold back all of this green regulation that's coming from Brussels. And I think that what the... Greens and the left, but particularly the Greens, haven't yet managed to do is they need to lean in and go much harder and link the cost of living crisis to the green agenda and actually talk about jobs. They need to talk about why it's important for Europe to have energy security, why pushing, pulling back now is not the answer and is not going to be cheaper in the long term. From our perspective, I think there's, they have, ironically, the Greens are not always sustainable politically. I mean, yeah. it's often cyclical. Protest so so I, I, really, well. I, really don't like, uh, I really don't like predictions too much, but they really have an element of cycles. So I wouldn't be surprised if in five years they come back again very strong, but there is an element of... And because presumably some of this is because they're in coalition in Germany yeah. too, so they're going to mm. get sumped that there. Could be, that could be the element. But there, there is a reality is that it, it's also not a quick fix. And so, mm. so if you want quick results, it's, it's not an element where there are quick results. Mm. So that yeah. is a bit... But another is issue, Andrea, is yeah. we've seen as well the Socialists and the European People's Party, so the Conservatives, the traditional groups who normally got on great, they're not getting on as well as they were. They're not going on as well as they were. There is also a moment in which, uh, even in Brussels, the green narrative is not the strongest. Mm -hmm. And so there are many divisive uh, factors at the moment. We've heard the State of the Union speech from mm -hmm. Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, I, at some points, I thought I was back in early 2000s mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there's emphasis on competitiveness, the emphasis mm -hmm. of cutting administrative burdens, uh, this positioning as a pretty much as a pro-business, pro, uh, mm. let's say, doing business approach. That's why she it's wants no to get the job again, so exactly. she's got to appeal to her own party. But that well, reverberates on, yeah. on the socialists and Democrats that obviously have a different agenda there. It's very divisive in that respect. Mm. We really have the experience of having to facilitate between two parties that don't cooperate as much. So yeah, the element of kingmakers is, is something that's really in our DNA and was very strong now. And we really have... Uh, the Green Deal, they needed our vote. So it's a very comfortable position uh, to be. And I really hope, uh, um, for us, it's really important to keep that, that position. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, often to, to find agreements between the two big political families. It's an element that we've really, the, the power we've had during this, this, this term gives also great responsibility for the next one. And, that and obviously, Diedrich, the more MEPs you have, uh, yeah. the more power you have, the more speaking time you have, the more perks and the more money you have as well for your messaging. So it so would be very interesting to see how that goes. For the time being, Jamie Duke, um, you met him earlier, the spokesperson of the European Parliament. He's not too phased about these projections. Take a listen. Incluso estos partidos que eran partidos. Even these parties that were once practically in favour of leaving the European Union are now making other types of proposals that do not consist so much of leaving, because it's cold outside, but rather of trying to adapt the European Union to what they believe it should be. I obviously prefer that the European Union not only continues to function as it has done up to now, but that if possible it functions better, because that is going to benefit us all. I believe that in any case, the EU will always be an added value, never the opposite. Jamie uh, Duke there, sounding pretty, pretty relaxed. But what's interesting as well, we've seen MEPs, a lot of them are trying to create one day for us all to vote, the Europe mm. Day, the 9th of May. They also want to make it easier for the 11 million Europeans that don't necessarily live in the country they were born mm. and don't have such rights to vote. I mean, there's so much work and perhaps treaty change that has to be done to make this exciting, mm. this election exciting, uh, Laura? Well, I think it's always struggled with that. I mean, I think people will come out and vote if they know how to and they've got interesting personalities in there. I think part of the... I know this is what the EU tried to do with the Spitzen candidate process, mm. but the problem is you're only, your candidates are only as good as the ones you get. 
aren't they? It's, it's imperfect. It's definitely imperfect, but the reality is my kids that are now living in Belgium, but they're Swedish, the reality that they, because they live here right now, have to vote for Belgium just doesn't make sense. It's not going to last. Mm -hmm. At one point, of course, we, we've been advocating for transnationalists for a long time, but the reality is it's going to happen at one point because yeah. you're going to get more of this strange situation where just because yeah. you happen to be registered we somewhere... I might say that this is the last yeah. election without a fully fledged European digital identity, yeah. and I think perhaps uh, in... Uh, Five years' time, there will be uh, there will be a different way of voting. Yeah. And personalities, you said. I mean, that's always an interesting mm. one to watch as well. We'll see who the big personalities of the next legislature are. But look, I really have to talk about a major election, even though we think the elections here in Europe are huge. But actually, it's the elections that are taking place in November over in the United States that will have a massive impact on us here in Europe, a massive impact on the world. And as it stands, it looks like two. Male seniors could be um, up for up for that seat, and we wanted to find out more about what the mood was uh, now in January over in the United States. So we chatted to Alan Abramovich. He's a political scientist and author at Emory University in Georgia. Among Republican voters, despite everything that's happened, Trump remains very popular. And in fact, uh, the indictments and various attacks on him—if anything—all these things reinforce the loyalty of his supporters, um, and they. Uh, contribute to a perception that he is a victim. What we know is that he's planning to surround himself in a second term with uh, uh, advisors and, and, and cabinet members who would be uh, much more supportive of his authoritarian and anti-democratic goals than officials were during his first term in office. Alan Abramovich there, political scientist, um, talking about a potential second um, Trump presidency, despite, of course, the news before Christmas from a top court in Colorado. I mean, this um, Trump presidency, number two, Andrea, could have a major impact here. We could see America pulling out of NATO. We could see a change of tune in Ukraine. Well, it, it's a nightmare and it's impossible to understand from our perspective. Uh, I actually was living in the U.S. when Trump was elected. There was a professor at Duke, uh, and uh, so very close to Georgia. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, you see how the, the belly of, of the country, the Midwest, is really disenfranchised completely from, from some of the, of the federal policies. And they really see, even if, you know, if someone who's far from being representative of what they experience, as being a reason to, you know, to to uh, um, mm. to vote together to as a protest vote and to support someone, irrespective of whether that person has respected the law or not, or whether it appears as a good person or not. And so, sense of concern here in um, in Brussels. I mean, it's obviously speculation, but. Trump, too, I mean, could have a major impact. Here. Yeah, he could. I mean, I think sales of Xanax will probably go through the roof if he gets mm. re-elected. I mean, I am not as fatalist, and I think we need to be really careful about this. It's still, you know, what, 10, 11 months until the elections. And I think it's really important that once he comes into focus as the candidate, you know, a lot of Americans don't like the crazy, you know. I mean, and they will make that decision closer to the time. I mean, this is not me saying they're going to overlook everything about Biden, but I think we need to take this with a pinch of salt. On the point about what it could mean for Europe, just on NATO, actually uh, last week or the week before last, the Senate passed and Congress passed a vote that was basically going to NATO-proof or US president-proof NATO's um, membership so that Donald Trump can't just pull yeah. people uh, at the UK the US out unilaterally. Sure. I mean, but he can still make thing, life very difficult. And it's also a wake-up call here in Europe for, yeah. that you can't just rely on Uncle Sam for defence. No, and they shouldn't have to. I mean, Obama said the same thing. He just said it quietly. I mean, yeah. Europe does need to pull its own weight on defence. Yeah. Trump isn't all, wasn't always wrong. He was just difficult about how he went about doing it and unpleasant. And on the 2% part, he even made uh, some sense. Uh, but right. that's not. But I think on... on it, it also shows the complexity of having only two options. Uh, that's, that's my yeah. vision as a European, but then, and sometimes I'm also frustrated having 10 European political parties and coalitions of eight parties in countries like Belgium. But, but the reality is it gives, it gives more nuance it's more in the public choice than... than uh, and than just very briefly, we're running out of time, but elections um, on the 17th of March, I believe, in Russia, at the end of um, March in Ukraine, interesting times. Very interesting times. We'll see what happens. The problem in Ukraine at the moment is uh, even bigger than the problem of elections. It's getting support now. There is a, pr a prospect of having some 15 million people needing humanitarian aid in Ukraine uh, next year. So even before the elections, 
the thing is getting get, getting support not only in terms of material support weapons and so on but also the money that is being blocked and i think this is a very bad dark page in the history of the european union at the moment having someone mm. that is really standing against uh, providing support to ukraine well we will keep an eye on all those elections it will be a fascinating uh, year for us here at euronews reporting on all those elections and hearing of course how they impact us here in Europe. But it's time now to take a very short break. Afterwards, we'll be taking a look at if it's possible to regulate AI. See you soon. Welcome back to Brussels, my love, with me, Maeve McMahon. Now, it's 2024, and although, as you've seen, we cannot predict election outcomes, we can be sure of one thing. And that is that AI will evolve at the speed of light this year and become more and more part of our lives. In order to get ahead, the EU has got a plan up its sleeve. A deal was sealed in December on new rules to regulate high-risk AI models and systems, including a list of where AI is prohibited. Of course, the devil is in the details, Andrea. I mean, you've followed these negotiations extremely closely. Can you elaborate more on this deal? What exactly was reached? Well, the first important question is asking whether AI can be regulated at all. And there's many people that would say, no, it cannot be regulated. It goes too fast. It's too pervasive. It's too multifaceted. And indeed, the answer from the EU is uh, largely no. We're not regulating AI. We're regulating uses and applications of AI, with one exception that I will explain in a second. So the idea of the AI Act is to build a classification of risks. And we're building, uh, uh, identifying applications that are too risky to be placed on the market. And so these are simply prohibited, meaning we don't know how to mitigate the risks uh, in a sufficient way. So social credit scoring uh, or uh, uh, predict for certain forms of predictive policing or using a real time uh, a bi biometric data to identify people in public places, all these are largely falling in that category. Mm -hmm. um, there are other uh, applications that have been pre-identified, but hopefully the list will have to evolve over time, which I consider to be high risk and thereby are regulated. And because, of course, it will take time as well for this to be actually come into force. Mm. Um, Diedrich, your political party, are they in favour of this deal that was sealed? Because obviously you're probably thinking about companies as yes. well and trying to get it right for them. Well, we've been very proactive on this. Huh? So it was under Eurova and, and Thierry Breton. So this is an element that is a compromise. It is imperfect, but it has the element of guaranteeing both the freedoms uh, uh, to still be able to use AI, obviously, in the field. I think what made it successful is indeed, as you rightfully pointed out, is to really put some risky business. AI in medical elements uh, is something you have to be careful in policing, is something you're careful. And there, I think the frame is very good. They so basically said, look, if it's human trafficking, if it's uh, questions of terrorism, then there is a way to use it. But we managed to protect from the Chinese point system, mm -hmm. and that is there. So there are, it's imperfect. It is a compromise. But I think the elements that we are, do you know how we usually joke around here in Brussels about saying EU invents, uh, China copies, EU regulates? Mm -hmm. It's not really a joke anymore because we use, sometimes regulation goes a bit too far. But this is one example where we put, set frames uh, with the info we have now. Uh, so we don't exaggerate in over-regulating, but we also don't leave it fully free and manage it's to called, protect the freedom. It's called the Brussels effect, yeah. right? Yeah, but um, I have an objection to that. But uh, Okay, we'll hear it, but let's just hear um, briefly from Laura your take on this and AI in general. I mean, what do you think of it? Do you use it? And how do you feel when you hear the likes of Elon Musk say it will steal all our jobs? I don't pay attention to anything Elon Musk <laughs> says but, uh, anymore, or ever, in fact. Uh, what do I do? I do use it. I find it really helpful for um, supporting me on my job because I get it to write me fake EU regulations for training exercises, although mm. you, you do have to prompt it to be way more jargony in order to get it right. Mm. Where I'm really uncomfortable with it is with the hallucinations, so where it actually projects stuff in a really confident way that turns out to be completely false. So, for example, I chaired a panel a couple of weeks ago. I asked it to help me with some questions. I asked it to find me some quotes that people had, not ChatGPT, it was one of the search engines. Mm. And I asked it to find me some quotes from people who were going to be on this panel to see what they'd said and the links to the sources, and it made them up. Three of the four guests, see, it completely it... made them up and it was really confident. Yeah, it doesn't have that information yet. I definitely rely on my questions for now. Yes, <laughs> better than AI. It's exactly the point. But it's great, but you have to yeah. know what you're using with it and what the limitations are. Because it needs to get are. to know us better. Need to be um, but I, would, I also wanted to hear what big companies um, feel about this AI act, like Amazon, Meta, TikTok, Google. Um, so we caught up with their representative here in Brussels. That's Cecilia Bonnefeldal. She's the head of Digital Europe. There is two sides of the coin. Uh, of course, it's always very positive when the EU has one regulation instead of 27. We are very happy with the risk-based approach and with 
regulating the uses of technology, not the technology itself. We are far, far behind in Europe on AI. Uh, we have around 8% of our companies that uses and have adopted AI. If you look at US, they're around 50%. And if you look at China, it's around 70%. In fact, I think it's going to make it much harder uh, we have a tsunami of regulation coming our way. And when that hits the smaller companies, it's going, they are going to struggle to implement. Cecilia Bonifeldal there um, from Digital Europe that also, um, may I add, represents 45,000 digital SMEs. She's worried about that tsunami of legislation. Well, that's not just the AI Act, right? There's been yeah. so much DSA. legislation, DSA, DMA, Data Act, Data Governance Act, that can go on forever. So <laughs> More on our we website, by the way, the in full, case our viewers need to know. For the full know. Brussels, my love. But uh, uh, that said, um, my opinion is that the EU should have closed the AI Act before and that it has experienced this year sort of a FOMO, a fear of missing out. Why? Because as AI continues to evolve, you have the temptation to reopen the dossier and write an additional piece and so on. So I think it's been a bit complicated. That's one thing. The second thing is uh, the Commission had promised to develop both an ecosystem of trust on AI, uh, which is largely the legislation and the standards that come with it, but also an ecosystem of excellence, which comes with investment and so on. And then we look at it at the moment, the ecosystem of excellence is simply not there. Looking, for example, at venture capital. Uh, at the moment, in recent calculations, we published a paper at SAPS on this, 61% uh, of venture capital in the world goes to the US, 17% goes to China, 6% goes to the EU. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that we, at the moment form and prepare uh, even more leading AI scientists than the US. Huh? And so uh, there is at least something to start from, meaning we have the talent, but the talent goes elsewhere. But it's we unlikely it will become the global playbook. I mean, we see the UK have their own executive order on AI. We saw the UK as well before Christmas had their mm. big summit on AI. I mean, the race to regulate is on. There's a trivial pursuit question now in the EU bubble, huh? is who killed the European Amazons, the European Facebook, the, and, and, and there's a lot of theories about it. Definitely the fact that it's easier to go to a market with, uh, with, with single rules for 400 uh, million, whereas uh, there are still some fragmented elements there. I think it's a combination of everything, but indeed not... We, we have some good examples, huh? there's this, Spotify, there's Skype, uh, even though bought over, but... but it, it still should be one priority to, to really analyse and see what do we do wrong Final point to lose this time. Well, it needs to be easier to fail mm -hmm. in Europe as well. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of serial failing companies that just keep resurrecting themselves with CEOs who mm -hmm. then end up in jail, which is what you get in the US. But I do think it needs to be easier for people to take risks mm -hmm. here in business terms. And I don't know if that's necessarily an EU thing or if it's a national thing. But it seems there's also a cultural thing, this sense of shame. But we'll get back to yeah. that topic another time because I'm afraid we're out of time, unfortunately, because that is a fascinating uh, discussion that we will, as I promise, get back to. But thank you so much to our panel for being with us and thank you so much for watching. Stay with us here on Euronews and for more news on anything you've heard today, check out euronews.com. Welcome back to Brussels, my love. I'm Maeve McMahon and along with our panel, Dietrich de Schetzen, Andrea Renda and Laura Shields, we're taking a look ahead to this year, to 2024. So let's get to know our panellists a little bit more and ask them what your personal plans are for this year and of course your wishes for Europe. Andrea? Well, I just took over as director of SEPS, so director of research at SEPS is the oldest and largest think tank in town. I have a very ambitious plan to uh, make it even more innovative, uh, more influential and impactful uh, without a you know, predefined agenda, but really to go for evidence-based, high-quality policy advice and involving as many stakeholders as possible. So that's okay. my, my personal... Workaholic here around the table. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Diedrich? Well, you're going to think it's about work too, but you know, I'll be on a stage in Eurovision uh, uh, and that is uh, because it will be the Eurovision debate between the lead candidates for presidency of the Commission. But if I want uh, for my kids, uh, they definitely would like me to get some tickets for the Eurovision music contest in Malmö instead. So that could be one objective to Wonderful. try to get. And we cover that here on Euronews. It's a great event. Laura? I'm going to promise to finish... No. I'm going to finish the book that I've been writing for two and a half years that has been hanging around my neck like an albatross and I'm going to finally get it done. And I'm saying that on TV. Wonderful. You've said it here first. We will keep an eye on that. Well, of course, we wanted to find out as well what people across the streets of Europe um, are feeling and hoping that this year will bring. So we sent your news reporters to the streets of Rome, Athens and Budapest. I want to see people smile more. Come on. Everyone should be smiling more often. 
and people should be more happy in general. We were born to be happy. My baby will be born in February. It would be nice if he could arrive in a more peaceful world. Better salaries and more jobs for young people. I don't have any expectations for 2024. Things will get worse. We are working 14 hours a day. We work ourselves to death to get zero in the end. I hope that things will get better for everyone, labor and socially mostly. I think this year is going to be a tough transitioning year. Many things are changing. I want to start my business. I want to buy an apartment, but I'm a long way from that. With a positive mindset, everything will be okay. And a big thanks to our teams in Greece, Italy and Hungary for gathering all those uh, views I mean, there's a bit of a thread of discontentment there, no? It's funny because people want optimism, but you mm -hmm. feel that there's also fear and there's also, and it's a reality, I think we feel it all. It's, uh, there, there's so many conflicts around the world right now that affect us directly. And, and I think it is now fair, and it's not a Miss Universe comments to say that we want peace, because I think we really do want peace. Uh, but. And, and, and I am in a way proud of some of, of, of people of my political family, what they did to try to achieve peace in, in some elements. But this is something where I think it is fair to want world peace now mm. and, and to, to contribute to it. Better jobs, better pay. Health was an issue as well that came up a lot and we didn't have time to play all the clips. Mm. Absolutely. But uh, well-being in particular will have to be at the centre and the forefront even of EU policy going forward. It is currently not really at the forefront. So my wish for Europe this year is to rebuild and, and find again its identity, meaning a, a, a development model and a vision for the future that is really uh, focusing on the well-being of people and more generally on mm. people, planet and prosperity rather than competitiveness. Laura? Well, I would agree on that point with Andrea, actually, and it's in, it was heartening that the European Commission brought out its mental health communication um, earlier this year, but they need to do a lot more work on that. I have a personal and family uh, history in that area, and I think that on the well-being point, a lot more time spent on how to help people cope with the challenges in the modern world would be something that would be really important. And I'm sure... And less macho politics, please. Less mm -hmm. macho politics. And on mental health, I'm sure every family in Europe has a personal story on that, so that is an issue that really needs to be addressed and that we would love to as well revisit here on Brussels, um, my love. But for now, it is time just to say a big thank you to Diedrich de Schetzen, Andrea Renda and Laura Shields for being our guests on this New Year's special. Thank you so much to you all and have a great New Year. Um, and thank you so much for watching, as always. If you have any comments for us or messages or stories that you want us to explore, please reach out. Our email address is brusselsmylove at euronews.com. You can also find us on Instagram and LinkedIn. Hmm. As you know, we love hearing from you. Take care and see you soon here on Euronews.